Welcome to a special live episode of Talking Books, which is a series on the leading books of the day from the same people who bring you Talking Feds. We're here live at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Give it up, give it up. Yay. Yay. And, boy, you clapped it right off the <laughs> um, And our focus today is the hugely acclaimed New York Times bestseller, The Divider, Trump in the White House, 2017 to 2021, which I think has redoubled in relevance two days ago when Trump announced his candidacy for 2024. So to read from the epilogue uh, from our authors, Trump emerged from a 7 million vote defeat, two impeachments, and the January 6th insurrection as the dominant force in the Republican Party. He remains the undisputed frontrunner for its nomination in 2024, should he mount a comeback. I'm really, really pleased to be joined today by the authors of those words taken from their comprehensive, meticulously reported, and wonderfully well-written important new book, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser. So to introduce them briefly, um, Peter Baker is an American journalist and author, the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times since 2008, during which time he's covered four presidents. He's won all three major awards devoted to White House reporting, the George R. Ford Prize for Distinguished Coverage, the Otto Beckman Memorial Award, and the Merriman Smith Memorial Award. He's also a political analyst for MSNBC and a regular panelist on PBS's Washington Week, and not least a fairly regular guest on Talking Feds. Thanks so much <laughs> for being here, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. And his co-author, Susan Glasser, a journalist and news editor right now at The New Yorker, where she writes the weekly column, Letter from Biden's Washington. She served as the top editor of several Washington-based publications. She founded Politico magazine, where she was the editor during the 2016 elections. And under her tenure as editor-in-chief, Foreign Policy won three national magazine awards. She also co-authored Kremlin Rising and with Peter, The Man Who Ran Washington, which is a fantastic biography of James Baker. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks. Great to be with you. All right. Um, I want to try to leave some time for questions from the audience and for discussion of, his, of Trump's new candidacy, but let's start um, here. So, there are a lot of new revelations in the book. For me, the broadest kind of main takeaway revision was to the conduct of the executive branch officials under Trump. So there seemed to be time after time a kind of internal battle for those who served, both whether they should take the job and then how they should execute the job. Um, and you have many instances of people that we I've always thought of as being kind of completely on his side, uh, but that seemed to be um, secretly not. So I, let me let me put it this way. I'm wondering, do you think the Republic was saved by these sort of behind the scenes resistors who are very different from what we appreciated in the daily coverage? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Harry, and thank you to everyone for being here today. Uh, Peter and I are delighted to be with you. Um, you know, I must say, uh, our publishers put 2017 to 2021 20, on the book uh, cover, uh, and, uh, you know, I know it might seem a little bit like a threat at this point. Uh, <laughs> I should say we don't have any particular plans at the moment to write a sequel, uh, but this goes very much to the question of that you're asking, which is essentially... What do we make of the people who surrounded and facilitated and enabled the Trump presidency? And I think that is the right question to be asking because in the end, right, Donald Trump without those folks is just another angry old dude shouting at the TV in between golf games. TVs. Right? <laughs> Plural. Right. Well, that we can talk about that too. But, you know, there's every spectrum of human behavior, right? Like I've always thought like Donald Trump is, an, you know, a mirror into other people's souls. Uh, Trump actually is remarkably unchanged, right? He is who he is. And the guy he was in 2016 is the guy in many respects he is today. But the question then becomes these people who surrounded him. And, you know, there's there's so many different, you know, kind of types. So there's the opportunists, 
Obviously, that's you could say that's almost all of them. Uh, you know, but certainly uh, you have people like Mike Pence and uh, you know the, the sort of hardcore religious right who would seem to share nothing in common with Donald Trump, except that he willingly essentially purchased their loyalty. And you know, they might think that they got a good uh, end of the bargain, right? You know, in just a few years, Trump transformed the federal judiciary. He used, uh, basically just accepted their checklist of uh, mm -hmm. nominees, transformed the Supreme Court. Uh, these folks had organized for a generation to eliminate Roe versus Wade. Uh, the Trump Supreme Court did that remarkably quickly. So there's a sort of transactional element to some of it. Uh, uh, there then are just the simple fact of ambition in Washington is a town that is driven by ambition. There are many examples of very senior officials who never would have had the job in any other administration. Uh, you know, obviously Mike Flynn never would have been national security advisor uh, to anyone else and only lasted 24 days as Donald Trump's national security advisor. But even someone like, say, Mike Pompeo, uh, you know, he never would have been secretary of state. He was a, basically a very junior congressman from Kansas who'd never chaired so much as a subcommittee uh, and whose only national security experience was uh, serving as a captain in the final days of the Cold War in the, in the U.S. Army. So there's the ambition factor. But then there really, there is also a category of people, which is so unusual. I mean, Peter and I have covered Washington for many, many years of uh, people who did define their presence in the Trump administration as in some way constraining uh, uh, the president, which is not a normal thing when you have the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, uh, when you have the, the first Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson. They really believed that it was their job to constrain the president. Of course, that ends up with this huge conflict in 2020 we could talk about between Trump and, and the generals, including the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Did you want to add or, you know, we, no, let, let me let me just go on from there. Yeah, we had, for example, the three time rule yeah. of people who just <laughs> right. took to generally ignoring, ignoring and then maybe having to do it. Well, let's go back to the Baker book, because, I, of course, you're right that ambition and maybe public interest are part of the story perennially in Washington. But but the you know, Baker details the sort of classic power brokerage of D.C., and as you uh, document, you know, in, in part because he had so, he, loyalty was so much the coin of the realm for him, it very much shrank the the sort of um, pool from which he was building. But how do you see the kind that level of not just power brokerage but genuine governance uh, having changed from a, a, the classical mm -hmm. period, if you want to call it that, of a James Baker to the Trump years. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. I think, look, in the Baker years, we could, we don't want to over-nostalgize the past or romanticize the past. There were plenty of, you know, miserable things Drunk that and happened disorderly, in Washington. Yeah, yeah, officials. Exactly. <laughs> but there was something different in the prior to the last, say, 10 years or 20 years, whatever, wherever you want to mark it, in which there was an incentive structure to, to get stuff done. You know, and Baker was a ruthless partisan during the election campaign. He ran the 1988 campaign that had Willie Horton and all of that with Michael Dukakis. But when it was over, he got together uh, like a month after the election in the apartment of Bob Strauss, the head of the D Democratic National Committee, to have dinner with Jim Wright, the Democratic Speaker of the House, to figure out how they could make the Contra War go away. And that's what you don't see today. And it's not just Trump, but Trump is obviously the manifestation of this polarization. That's why we call it the divider, because the notion of compromise and getting stuff done is anathema in Washington right now. Not only is it anathema, it is a, you will be penalized for it. You will be, and it's just true on both sides, but it's particularly true under Trump and particularly true with Republicans today, in which you will, you're more afraid of being uh, attacked from your political right if you're a conservative or political left if you're a liberal for getting along with or trying to get along with the other side, for doing anything with it. If you compromise with this side, it means you sold out. Trump has taken that on steroids, and he never had any interest really in cooperating. His whole modus operandi was to divide and conquer. And that was the, he's, every president does some division. Division is part of politics. You have to divide in order to win an election. You have to say, my candidate is better than your candidate. My program is better than your program. But Trump, for him, you know, division was always the goal, not just a means to the end. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. I mean, it did seem like, 
um, disloyalty was the, you know, expected and people got in serious trouble if they were, you know, even even tried to work on the other side. Let me ask you one aspect of him. He comes across, as he has in other um, volumes, as being, you know, 98% of the time brazen and indifferent, but, uh, but uh, you know, parts of the time extremely sensitive to criticism. And I'm going back again to Baker and the workings of the White House, because you, on the one hand, detail a management style that seems driven by chaos and the pitting of officials against one another. But it also seems, at least early on, that the reports from the press of dysfunction and chaos drove him mad and, and you know, <laughs> sort of around the bend and apoplectic. You see where I'm going. You know, what what what, what is the true Trump here? Was mm-hmm. it sort of a thoughtful um, use of, of chaos and dysfunction or... Did he want to be at least seen as an orderly manager Hmm. or maybe both? Well, I don't think he prioritized that too much. I, I, you know, I once was in a conversation uh, with Chris Christie and people were suggesting, well, maybe Trump really has, you know, a strategy here. And he just like jumped down their throat and he was like, people, come on, let me just tell you, this guy, you know, at breakfast time isn't planning ahead to lunch. Okay. You know, like put that away from your minds. He's not a strategic grand master. Number one. And I think that's important. We should say that. Um, Trump, chaos, dysfunction, you know, that's his game. He's not going to change. You know, it's like I always it's like the bad boyfriend theory of the case. Right. Like, you know, obviously this is a 74 year old man who's very set in his ways. Like you're, he's not changing. He is who he is. Uh, and what's interesting is that, you know, that that's why, again, to this divider thing, we it's about his personality as well as a kind of political and management philosophy. But, you know, the reason that the scorpions inside the White House were literally fighting each other from day one, that's how Trump wants it. He's the enemy of any org chart that ever existed. He's the enemy of all hierarchy. He, uh, you know, he, we have these great scenes from the very foundational weeks and days of the White House where he would be like, oh, hey, you know, who are you? You know, and then, you know, what do you do? And, you know, he wouldn't remember what they do or he'd say, well, who do you work for? And the person would say, well, the chief of staff. And he'd say, no, 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 don't work for him. You just work directly for me. And of course, that's classic. The more that his advisors and even at his company, the Trump Organization, before he became president, uh, that's a way of preserving his power. If they're fighting with each other, you know, he is still the supreme leader, right? And so that's fundamental to sort of who Trump is. And I think you would be, you know, very safe to to bet that, you know, any organization that he ran, that's the way in which he would do it. Now, to the other question about loyalty as the main criteria, Uh, you know, obviously Trump made a lot of mistakes if loyalty was his main criteria. He didn't know. Uh, He was very ignorant when he came to Washington. Uh, and he was uh, didn't bring years of, you know, experience and, you know, kind of a team that he wanted to install in it. So he literally uh, would make a judgment. He would, you know, interview uh, Rex Tillerson, uh, who he didn't know at all, who was the, the CEO of ExxonMobil. He said, well, he, he looks the part. He looks so distinguished. That's what my secretary of state should look like. And I know it sounds crazy, but there are so many examples. We have a paragraph that just literally lists all the people that he said he fits the part. He looks the part. He fits the suit, basically. And so that goes to your other question. Why did he care about being criticized for the chaos and disorganization? Trump is all about appearance. Uh, he didn't care about really the substance of most things. That's partially why he's willing to trade away. Don't you think, Peter? Like the um, policy is not what motivates Donald Trump. He's not an ideologue in that sense. He may advance ideological goals, but, you know, he's happy to trade away federal judgeships mm-hmm. if he needs power. And uh, what he cared about was how he looked on TV uh, and what they said about him on TV and how he could shape that. He wants to be seen as a superman basically. So he doesn't mind chaos. In fact, he once said in one of the most honest statements he ever made, I like conflict, <laughs> right? I mean, we're not going to call him on that one. We're going to no fact, fact check true. He likes conflict. But if you report that he has a chaotic uh, White House, it seems as a criticism, even though that's what he wants. And therefore he bristles at that. But you're right. He, 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 um, he has to be seen as perfect. At one point, his uh, first secretary, Madeleine Westerhout, said to Hope Hicks, one of his aides, she says, you know, gosh, the, the president looks tired today. And Hope Hicks corrected her. The president is never 
tired, and he is never sick. And that's the way he wanted to be seen. He's so enamored of this idea of being a Superman that when he had COVID, he actually, before leaving the hospital, it was a little on steroids at the time, said, let's get one of those Superman shirts and I will go to the White House and I will rip off no, my it was an, shirt. It was, it was an honest thought, right? He was going to do that. He's going <laughs> to open his shirt and there was going to be a Superman t-shirt to show that he is basically in, you know, invulnerable and a, and a superhero. Amazing. So you mentioned Christie and there are, there's so many um, people who I get, who I think get new glosses here. I just want to, and he's one of them, but I just want to deal with a couple of them. I, uh, the, a real revelation to me from the book was Mike Pence, mm. who I've thought of, I think many people have as this kind of passive milk toast figure in the back being loyal when asked. He comes off repeatedly as the guy who some of the officials go to, to for either consolation or he gives them advice. He, he seems to have had a much more uh, active and, and sort of peacemaking role in the White House than we knew. Is that fair? Well, I mean, you know, I, I do. There are there are numerous examples yeah. in the book, uh, especially when he then becomes the, the, the the COVID mm -hmm. task force. Where, yeah. where people Nielsen. sought his counsel. You know, Pence was one of the only people who had any experience in that White House in Washington. That's the amazing thing. Even someone like Rex Tillerson, he was a big corporate CEO. He actually was very ignorant about how to make the the levers of power in Washington work. So Mike Pence had been a congressman. He had a lot of, uh, you know, ties and, and he was part of the Coke, uh, you know, money network too. So he, you know, he was very well connected in his part of, you know, kind of conservative Washington relative to the Trump world, which was a bunch of newcomers. So partially it's that, right? He he reflects a little bit more how to get things done. Also, he's, um, I mean, his persona is completely different than Donald Trump's, right? You know, Trump was seeking uh, 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 conflict. He was seeking uh, disruption. He was indifferent uh, to those who worked around him. Uh, Pence, you know, by all accounts was, a, you know, sort of a, a decent in, and, and had personal standards of decency <laughs> in how he treated others who worked around him. So, you know, I would say that. But if you started out with a, a view of uh, Pence as a, you know, kind of um, – pointless, you know, sycophant through yeah. most of the White House, I would say our reporting did, should not disabuse you of that notion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right, well, then what about here? So, God, there's so many people, but I wanted just a couple more. Bill Barr. Mm. So, um, you know, you have him being, even before this kind of final, I'll submit my resignation taken uh, moment, something that really struck me is, I think it's in the spring, he, uh, they are investigating Hunter Biden. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, Trump gets impeached trying to just get the president of Ukraine to just say there's an investigation. This would have been, and all he wanted was a sort of red Statement meat talking effect, point. Right? Mm -hmm. Talk about, a, you know, this, this would have, uh, you know, he'd have been all over this on the campaign trail. Do you think, uh, you know, Barr, and, and I'm, I'm part of this, I had first worked for him, said great things about him, and then was, was deeply, um, you know, distressed when he, he seemed to come be, you know, so sycophantic toward Trump. Do you think he, uh, it's time for a reevaluation of his role in the administration? Well, I, I'll leave it to evaluate or not yeah. evaluate, but I think he is a complicated figure, right? I think that what makes him complicated is that a lot of the decisions that he made seem like they were in, um, in, in response to some sort of tweet or some sort of, de, you know, demand by the president it certainly seemed in his interest, whether it be spinning the Mueller report in the most favorable light possible, whether it be dismissing or trying to dismiss the case against Michael Flynn, even after he pleaded guilty, whether it was reducing the sentence for reducing sentence recommendation for Roger Stone, all those seem like, aha, he's doing Trump's bidding. It may actually be that he actually believed that. Yeah. Right. And so he, what he certainly was always yeah. very skeptical about the Mueller exactly. investigation. Exactly. And so yeah. he happened to actually be on the same page as Trump. And he resisted the idea that he was taking direction from Trump, hated that impression that he was given. And so in his mind, what he would say is he had principles. His principles just weren't what his critics wanted them to be, mm -hmm. you know, and that his principles was he did think that Russia investigation was a hoax. There was something wrong about the way it was started and all that kind of thing. But that when push came to shove, there were things 
he, where he do, did draw the line. He did not, in fact, publicize the fact that they had a Hunter Biden investigation because that's against the rules. You're not supposed to do that kind of thing as an as a attorney general. And he did, of course, ultimately at the end say, no, there's no fraud there uh, sufficient to overturn the election. And therefore, we're not, I'm not going to say that there is. And you can't make me say that there is. So he's a complicated figure in that way. That doesn't, that doesn't mean you should agree with the things he did before just because you found that he did what you thought to be the right thing at another point, but it is more complicated than a cartoon figure. Although, You're shaking your head a lot. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I agree with what Peter's saying, but I think it's also, in, in some ways, our book is a little bit of an answer to some of the people like Bill Barr who, you know, got off the train at the very end and said like, oh my goodness, it's taken a crazy detour, you know, after November 3rd, 2020. <laughs> you know, I'm shocked Where to find, you know, from? like, right. you know, like Donald shocked Trump is going gambling. crazy. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> you Chevrolet, know, and, right. and actually, this is a very widespread view. Uh, it's not limited to Barr, but, you know, Barr, uh, definitely, if you read his memoir, there's some, you know, definitely he's very forthright and, and specific about 2020 and the election and that it wasn't rigged. And I think that's very important because it's certainly important to show that Trump was told by his own officials, uh, by people who you certainly can't dismiss as, you know, kind of just liberal haters, right? So I, I, I don't diminish that. But it's kind of like with Mike Pence, uh, you know, who has this moment where he, you know, stands up to Trump. At the very end, after four years of going along with it, now he has a memoir out, even more of a kind of awkward contortion dance, right, to somehow justify the four years, but then say, oh, but at the end, that was really crazy. And, Reckless. you know, I think <gasps> if, you, if you look at our book, if you yeah. look at the record for four years, you know, let's be real. Donald Trump didn't just lose his, you know— mind on November 3rd uh, because he was so upset at this unthinkable loss. He first tweeted that the 2020 election was a rigged election in May of 2020 before there was any voting. He then spent months campaigning publicly uh, uh, on the idea that it was rigged and privately orchestrating and planning lawsuits around the country uh, that would be used to then undermine uh, the results and, and have people question its legitimacy. Bill Barr knew about that. Mike Pence knew about that. They never said a word before the election uh, about that. And, you know, to me, it just is a very interesting example. And I think that when you look back and you realize in the very first workday of the Trump presidency, this, this kind of blew Peter and I's mind when we were working on this. So back in January of 2017, he invites the congressional leadership to his office. That's like a, you know, traditional thing you're supposed to do on day one, we'll all work together. And what does he start talking about? In January of 2017, he starts ranting to Nancy Pelosi about how the 2016 election was rigged and there were millions of illegal votes in California, he tells her. And she literally says to him, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, again, I just think that's the value of like, you know, kind of like, calling BS on, you know, these figures who are complicated, like Peter said. It's not, you know, like, okay, well, he was bad and now he's good, you know, Bill Barr. I mean, you know, his record is his record and, you know, history probably won't look too favorably on a lot of it. Yeah, there. I mean, there. those few months are so interesting to me. I remember very much, this is when I sort of started my whole, um, you know, part in this is when he fired Comey because there were everyone around and you detail it beautifully and Rod Rosen's done crying and the like, but people just had no idea how friggin' crazy he was. That was the first revelation, 25th Amendment. And after that, you know, it just became par for the course. All right, one more, one more figure. Mm. Mark Meadows. You within mm. two pages of your book, <laughs> he is uh, emailing Ginny Thomas mm. and saying, you know, I've staked my career on this. The King of Kings will, you know, will 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 prevail. Fight for and the having daily meetings, phone calls with the supposed who's ever, you know, left of the, um, you know, resistance being uh, Mark Milley and Mike Pompeo, you know, will the real mm -hmm. Mark Meadows please stand up? Um, he was discussed. He was one of the fascinating yeah. figures, right? For those who may not remember, he was the last chief of staff, but he'd been a congressman in, in the Freedom Caucus uh, before that as one of Trump's top allies. And we went into this book asking the same question. Okay, so what was he in the end? Was he th one of the land the plane guys on the phone with the grown-ups saying, let's make sure the country is safe in these final few crazy days, no matter how out of control Trump might be, let's try to keep things, you know, from getting too far? Or 
was the, the enabler who was saying, hey, let's go for it. Let's let's pretend that the election was stolen and claim that and, and go as far as it will take us. And I think after uh, our reporting and certainly after the January 6th committee hearing, I think it's really the latter. In fact, we quote somebody in the book uh, calling him the matador because he would mm -hmm. simply wave the flag and come on in, guys. Anybody want to come into the Oval Office, no matter how crazy their theory, whether it's Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, the My Pillow guy, Mike Flynn with his martial law, you know, declaration, all of these fringe characters who never would have been in the White House of any other president were suddenly uh, given free access to the president of the United States, whispering what he wanted to hear which is he didn't really lose because he can't stand the idea that he might lose and giving him all these theories, no matter how crackpot they were. That and maybe that was how, in fact, they got into the office, exactly. being the last people who were saying Exactly, that, yeah. right. And you, so this is, goes to your earlier question, right? Does it matter who is there? Why are these people who decide to go in, they're opportunists, they're ambitious, and they're public spirited in some you know, mix of all of those different things. But it made a difference at times. It's not like the adults in the room ever made Trump into a normal president, but you can definitely see instances where they made a difference, right? Where some things that could have happened and gone drastically wrong didn't because somebody was there to say, whoa, wait a second. The three, the three times rule, which he refers to, means that age said if the president ordered them to do something crazy, they just ignored him the first two times. <laughs> if he'd come back with a third time, then they had to figure out how some how to get out of it some yeah, way. Yeah. And in the end, basically, I think with um, you would see, for instance, had John Kelly been the chief of staff at the end rather than Mark Meadows, Kelly might not have stopped January 6th, but he would have thrown his big six foot two Marine yeah. body in the doorway of the Oval Office to stop. My pillow guy for getting in there, that's for sure. He really comes off very admirably. All right, I want to move to the divider himself. But first, I, I just want to ask you two, you know, it's not the first book you've written together. I Many of the rules, like, compare it to a novel. And it's really true. It's incredibly readable and you're pushing forward. And this is stuff, you know, we've, I, I'd lived through before. And yet, so it, it, it really, it's also very sort of, smoothly uh, written for Thank being co-authored. And I, I just wanted to ask a little bit about process, how <laughs> you, you know, who's the, uh, if you have a sort of set kind of routine on it, because it strikes me as a really impressive um, achievement just from the view of, you know, prose and structure for a co-authored work. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's very kind of you. Uh, you know, the good news is that, you know, Peter and I, are still on speaking terms, so you know, uh, <laughs> it, we managed to get through it. Is there uh, another book of the yeah, author? Yeah, you know, it's actually our third <laughs> book. One first. It's our third book together. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, although each one is a little different, right? And this this was a very ambitious book to do in this amount of time, right? To do a whole four year history. Uh, you know, most presidencies you'll have something like this. Uh, uh, Lou Cannon was a, a wonderful chronicler of the Reagan presidency at the Washington Post, and then did kind of the definitive book on his time in office. Um, uh, you know, but that came out probably like a year or more after, you know, this one would have this time. And that's because Donald Trump, you know, we wanted it to be a book of history, but it turned out to be a book of current events, right? And so, you know, there was a certain urgency to put it out in this in this political moment before the midterms. And now there'll be a whole new era of, of Trump one way or the other. But, you know, so Peter and I really just divided this one up, uh, you know, 50-50. We came up with an outline. Each of us would, you know, do the first draft of half the chapters, and then we'd, you know, pass it back and forth. And, um, you know, basically we didn't have enough time to do it, so maybe that limited our ability to argue over it because we just <laughs> had to <laughs> race and get it done, right? I guess I can do the big reveal now, not much of a surprise in the room, that in addition to being co-authors, you are spouses, so that's yes. probably, yeah. <laughs> if anybody doubted that. Um, all right, so just several things on, let's get to the divider. Um, I was fascinated. You guys really seem to get down to the atomized detail of his tweeting. And so he never reads anything. He is watching TV all the time. But you literally, you know, say during this three week period, he tweeted 900. Do you have a sense of how my, we think of tweets? I you know, hope to think of tweets as something you a little bit do on the side. It seems like it might might have been like hours a day for the guy. Do you oh, have yeah. any sense of this? Yeah, that was his job description as he saw it was a tweet. I mean, that was his way of communicating to the country. And it's, you know, one of the things that was really fascinating about Trump covering him, and I've been covering presidents now since Bill Clinton, um, and with our friend uh, Todd Purdom, who's, I think, gone, but Todd's he was here. here. Think, oh, okay. uh, and what's remarkable about Trump is he is the most transparent president I think we've ever had. 
right? Because he, there was no unexpressed thought. Every time he had a thought, click, 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 he put it out there and he loved it. He relished it. He would like brag and he would say, you want me to uh, watch this? He would say, da, 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 da. And they would point to the TV screen and like, you know, 10 seconds later, there's a Chiron on CNN saying, Trump says this, whatever <laughs> outrageous thing he had just decided. And he loved it. In fact, Lindsey Graham told us that he deliberately, that is Trump, did misspellings or what have you just to drive people crazy because it would get them. Now, maybe that's true and maybe that's just a way of explaining why he called his wife Melania, Mel Melanie. <laughs> I'm not really sure, but he definitely loved getting a reaction. Owning the libs, of course, is the phrase that, like, that people on the right like to use. And that was per part and parcel of who his presidency, what his presidency was all about. And he would, you know, Sometimes it was about his id. Sometimes it was you know, modestly strategic, perhaps in some small fashion, but it was always just sort of instinct, gut, and, and impulse. Remarkable. Um, as we look for, did, as we look um, ahead now, you know, there is, and we'll, I hope we'll have a few minutes to talk about this, but in general, there are two big forces out there, I think. There's the, you know, Republican elite and who, the normal party officials, and then there just is... His base, which, you know, he says again and again, I'll take care of them, everything will take care of itself, and his track record on it is formidable in a way. But you um, gave an account of his relationship to his base that was more complicated than anything I'd read before. And in particular, here's the, this sentence uh, really jumped out at me, that he was sometimes fearful of the base and that he was both the avatar of Trumpism and its hostage. Can you explain a little more? Well, I think this really became clear, uh, you know, during COVID and, you know, uh, over the last couple years. Uh, when Trump is, you know, running for re-election in 2020, this huge global pandemic comes. Of course, he takes it completely personally, you know, never mind, you know, what it's doing to the world or to his own country, right? It's all about him and his re-election. And uh, that was one of the reasons that I think he politicized the response to it from the very beginning. But, you know, he, from the summer of 2020, you know, it became very clear to us, I think, in going back and doing the book, he, he was also concerned uh, that he didn't want to alienate or anger his base in any way. And I think that's the part about the base is leading him. He understands his insight in politics is that I have this kind of fanatic core Republican following. And rather than trying to expand my coalition, as politicians used to do in the past, right, to get to 51%, I'm just going to get my base so fanatically motivated by me uh, and make sure that they all come out even in greater numbers than they would normally. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to persuade anyone else to join my team. I'm just going to motivate my team again and again and again. And so when there's early discussions in the White House about uh, mask wearing, for example, and it's not yet been completely uh, turned into a kind of partisan football, uh, you know, Trump doesn't like the idea, uh, but many of his advisors are just saying, well, just do it. You know, that's what you need to do. And it polls really well. And they're showing this. Mark Meadows, his very ultra right um, new chief of staff. Meadows comes in right at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Meadows says, absolutely not. Your people won't like it. Your people won't like it. No, no on the mask. And boom, right? It's a political decision, but it's also about he might have been willing to do it, but he's afraid to alienate the base. That summer of 2020, remember, of course, the uh, killing of George Floyd and, you know, this huge moment movement for racial justice around the country breaks out. Donald Trump, now he certainly has the instincts to polarize immediately, right? He's tweeting law and order, uh, you know, seeing like that he's going to have visions of running Richard Nixon's 1968 campaign all over again. Uh, but it's not enough for some of the real, uh, you know, kind of people on Fox TV, Tucker Carlson. He's very worried, uh, you know, that they're going to expose him on his right flank. And I think that's another example. And then the example we use in the book is about the vaccines. Right. Uh, and when we interviewed Trump, uh, which we did twice at Mar-a-Lago for the book, uh, you know, the first time he's he's already taken the vaccine uh, and he tells us that he's uh, considering an offer from the Biden administration to do a public service announcement to try to get some of his vaccine skeptical uh, uh, supporters to do it. OK, well, we come back. Uh, at the end of the year, in November of 2021, uh, just, I think, a year ago tomorrow. Uh, and we say, hey, whatever happened to that public service announcement about the vaccines? 
And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and uh, we said, well, you told us that, you know, they were going to, uh, you know, they asked you to do it. And how come you didn't do it? He says, oh, no, no one ever asked me. Where where'd you hear that? We heard it from him. <laughs> so, okay, so putting aside the classic, you know, kind of casual lying, what's really fascinating is that what happened in between is that he mentioned the vaccines at one of his rallies. Yeah, like and he was actually he booed. Was booed right? He was mm -hmm. booed by his crowd. And Donald Trump can, you know, we can insult him till we're blue in the face on this podcast. And he is not, you know, he doesn't really care, right? Because we're saying his name. But his base booing him, that is something he's really scared of. Last question on him. So I think this very meeting you're talking about is, your, is where your epilogue um, begins. And you refer to him as, I think, jarringly incoherent. <laughs> not a, you know, there's not a sentence with, at least as we think of sentences, you know, noun, verb, object. <laughs> Period. Um, no period. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but you've been covering him for years. Do you think in these six, seven years he's declined? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. In the last six years, um, certainly over the, a longer time range for sure. You know, I went back. I didn't cover him in New York. I, I covered him once he got to the White House. I, you know, and so my first experience with him, my first interviews with him were early in, in 2017. And if you go back though and look at or listen to his interviews back in the 80s and the 90s, say with you know Howard Stern, he would go on the radio show all the time. It's a remarkable difference. It's a remarkable difference. His, his range of vocabulary is smaller. Um, his you know depth of conversation is is less. His ability to form a sentence is clearly constrained compared to where it was. It was never like a, the most articulate person in the world. 20 or 30 years ago, but it was, there's a striking difference between then and now. And so I, there is some diminishment. Is that just age, something else? I'm not a doctor. I don't know. But yeah, he's, he, he what words does he use all the time? He uses the word strong all the time. Strong, strongly, strong, strong, strong. Listen for it. You'll hear it. It's like, it's like a drinking game. If you watch a trunk speech, <laughs> every time he says strong, drink, <laughs> right? And he will use it in every context, even if it doesn't make any sense. I'm listening to you strongly. What does that mean? Listen to you strongly. Strongly is just the adverb or the adjective he will use in any sentence, no matter what he actually means. We haven't been in war for decades. Um, all right. So yes. look, this is a fantastic right. uh, book, and and it's 2017 and 21. I don't want to charge you <laughs> with having to know the future. In addition, but here we are. He announced a couple of days ago, and you, Susan, have already written um, about it in the New Yorker. In fact, I wanted to set it up with this. Um, you know, you you write. We've had. On the one hand, there's a remarkable withdrawal of support among the elite class. On the other, though, you know, we've had moment after moment, maybe beginning with Access Hollywood. That was when I first thought, oh, well, he's done. Um, when it seemed he would implode, but there was always the pivotal fact of the undying support of his base. So you ask, why this time should it be any different? So why should it be? And we can all three talk about this, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, I think you do need to consider him the front runner for the Republican nomination. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that he's guaranteed to get it. But remember, no one else has actually jumped in. And part of the reason for Trump's early announcement was to try to scare off uh, other contenders. I do think there will be other people who will run, including his former vice president, Mike Pence. And, uh, you know, so that in and of itself is a big difference in 2020. Uh, as the incumbent president, he successfully did scare off any other Republicans from challenging him for the nomination. And history certainly shows uh, that uh, a divided uh, fight for the nomination makes it harder for you to win the general election. Uh, so you got to consider him the front runner, uh, although it's very interesting to see in the, you know, 10 days uh, since the midterm election results did not turn out as well as expected for Republicans. You have seen almost, you know, a kind of uh, palpable shifting of support. You see on some of the like uh, Fox uh, and Rupert Murdoch media, almost a, a transparent effort to build up Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, to be kind of the, the you know, the presumptive heir apparent, kind of a Trump without the baggage seems to be the, you know, the approach of, of, of 
how they're selling. DeSantis, there's some polls in individual states in, outside of Florida where it shows uh, DeSantis now uh, gaining steam and even leading Trump in some of those states. Getting some big fund rate Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's some of the big funders who were breaking with Trump. But, you know, look, he's going to have plenty of money. I mean, he has turned uh, Trumpism into, you know, it's many things, but it's also a grift and it's a big giant fundraising machine. And he's, he's made literally... Uh, not just millions or tens of millions, you know, but hundreds of millions of dollars off of the rigged election lies. Uh, that's been a really an economic model, you know, for the perpetuation of Trumpism. So I just I think there's a little bit of irrational exuberance kicking in here that, you know, Trump uh, being down doesn't mean that Trump is out. Uh, and in fact, that narrative of, uh, you know, crisis and, you know, overcoming the crisis is, is one that has fueled the Trump drama all along. So that's that's one thing I would say. And remember, the, the, the other point that I think is really important for people is that back in 2016, the entire Republican establishment was against Donald Trump, including they, Fox News. They hated him. Right? They yeah. hated him. Uh, his opponents trashed him. They didn't, you know, hold back or anything. But he prevailed over 17 opponents. A divided field helped Donald Trump then, and it could very likely help him now. Peter, your, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, look, um, I come back to January 6th. If, they, if the Republican Party wasn't going to be uh, willing to abandon him after January 6th, then we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves at this point, right? Because this is different. Now, the thing that will make them get rid of him or the thing that will make him, them abandon him is if he proves no, no longer have, you know, the base as his support. You know, they, I asked a Republican senator once who doesn't like him. I said, well, why don't you say anything? He said, because they did a poll in my state, he said, and 88% of Republicans in my state like Donald Trump. They approve of him. And that's more than they approve of me. In other words, he has, Trump had more control over their constituents than they did. And so they're not willing to break with him. The only thing that will change that is if that's not true. So it matters less that Steve Schwartzman and Ron Lauder and those types are breaking with it. What matters is if at some point the base moves on and says, okay, we're done. You know, yeah, we still like Donald Trump. Yeah, we like his policies. Yeah, we may even like some of his personality, but let's just face it. We're, we're talking too much about the past. Let's get a better person without baggage. Maybe that's DeSantis. He's the clean version of, of Trump. If the base says that, then the politicians will follow. I mean, it really is as simple as that. I don't know if that's this moment. We'll have to find out. Yeah, but that's what that's that's how it'll happen. If it and happens. of course, the politicians that you're talking about, you point out in the book, we have some figures who either were from or could have been from the Republican Party of 20 years ago, guys like Mitt Romney or Lamar Alexander. But in, on at, on both the House and the Senate, you don't really have those guys anymore. Mm -hmm. There is not the same kind of establishment Republican. It's a party. Trumpier House Republican conference now than the one that we just had in the last few years. Yeah, that's right. That uh, the old Republican Party of even 2015, forget about 20 years ago, is not coming back. You can't go backwards in politics. And in part, Trump has shown the way uh, for a politician of any party, whether Democrat or Republican, uh, that some of the guardrails that we thought existed don't exist, uh, that you can blow past uh, norms or flout uh, 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 traditions and succeed with that in ways that, you know, a, you will find temptations of potentially eventually from a left-wing demagogue as much as from a right-wing demagogue. Now, I think there are structural differences in the parties right now. Y you know, we have a situation where one party has been radicalized. And I think in all of the focus on is it going to be Trump, is it going to be DeSantis, I think it, it's also worth taking a breath and saying, you know, this is not just another election that we're heading into. We are actually still in the ongoing crisis created, in my view, by the assault on the foundations of the democracy a couple years ago. Because you have one party that followed Trump off the cliff of, you know, basically off a constitutional cliff. Uh, and, you know, the basic compact that we have in the country, right, is that win or lose, you accept the results and, you know, that we don't, you know, come to blows with each other over it. And that's how we, you know, we, we wait until the next election and we reorganize and we get our act together and we try again. And that's how it works. And it would have been bad enough if Trump himself was a sore loser. But I do think that bringing the Republican Party along with him, uh, and, and, and that's the thing, you can, there's been so much focus in the last 10 days on, 
you know, high profile election deniers who lost, like Carrie Lake in Arizona. Uh, unquestionably a good thing for those who care about democracy, small d, but I think there's been a little bit less focus on how many election deniers are in the U.S. Congress. Remember that in the hours after the Capitol was assaulted on January 6th, they then came back in to finish the job, stepping over the broken glass of the Capitol, two-thirds of the House Republican Conference, two-thirds, uh, including Kevin McCarthy, who now may be the Speaker of the House, uh, voted not to certify Biden's election even on January 6th itself. And so hundreds of election deniers have been elected uh, to uh, important offices, in, including in Congress, uh, just 10 days ago. And I, I think that makes it an ongoing crisis. In the polls on election day, it was still two thirds of Republican voters in the country, two thirds, uh, who said that Joe Biden was not legitimately elected president. This isn't a partisan, you know, it's not a policy issue. It's not like, well, what kind of health care system we should have in the country. It's whether you accept, you know, the basic rules of the road in the country or not. So, I, you know, I just, I think that a party that's willing to go that far with Donald Trump, you know, is it doesn't seem like they're breaking up with him, uh, you know, because yeah. they didn't get, you know, they still won the House, but they didn't get like, you know, 20 more seats. And in the 24 hours since they, you know, their uh, victory was announced by a sliver, they've come out with their big agenda item, investigating <laughs> Hunter Biden's laptop. Okay, we have we have a few minutes for a couple questions from the audience, uh, which is, by the way, very substantial. Thanks to everyone for coming. Did anyone have a question they wanted to pose? That's a great question. And one we have all wrestled with. For those who might not have been able to hear on the podcast, the microphones, uh, is the question is, does Donald Trump actually believe the election was stolen or is it just a way of, of you know, grasping at straws to, to, to cover up a defeat? And, you know, nobody knows for sure, but there's definitely evidence that in the days after the election, he seemed to understand that he had lost. In our book, we quote him telling an aide, how did I lose this effing guy, meaning Biden? Okay, so he knew he lost. He said it. We talked about like the next administration will have to deal with this or that or the other thing. He says that in private in those early days. So he knew after the election that he lost. And he was told by a number of people, not Democrats, by Republicans, by people he worked for, that he lost. He was told that there was no there or there when it came to this election fraud stuff. Not just Bill Barr, his attorney general, but the next attorney general who followed Bill Barr, by the way, and his own election uh, campaign staff and the election security chief from the DHS, who he then proceeded to fire. And, you know, uh, his own daughter and son-in-law knew the election hadn't been stolen. All these people knew and, and told him that he hadn't uh, been cheated of this election. And yet he went out and said it anyway. So you have to then impute from that that he knew, at least at that time, that it wasn't true. Right now, does he today? Has he, has he said it so many times that he's now convinced himself because he creates his own reality? It's possible. There are people who've known him for a lot longer than I have and who are a lot closer than I have who says he does sort of invent this reality in his head and he lives in that reality. And, and I'm not a shrink, so I don't know what that's like. But it is possible he convinces himself of these things at, so, at a certain point. And it, it, in some ways, I guess, it doesn't really matter, I suppose, because he keeps saying things that he has every reason to know are not true. And he knows that there's a real cost to that. There's a cost to our country, a cost to our society. Democracy is about faith. If we don't have faith in the system, if we don't believe that it works, then then we're just tearing it apart. And that's what he's doing consciously and knowingly. Yeah, and just to be clear, like, you know, no, Donald Trump does not think that uh, the ghost of Hugo Chavez, like, came down into hundreds and thousands of voting machines across the country and stole millions of ballots. Like, he, he, he knows that that's not true, uh, just to be clear. You know, like, Peter's right. Like, he says over and over again, this grievance, I think, might be real, you know, because it's so deep inside of him. Uh, but uh, there's ample evidence. And, you know, from a legal point of view, yeah. uh, you know, Harry can tell you, but it, the fact that he was advised so clearly by his own campaign, by his campaign's lawyers, by the attorney general of the United States, by the acting attorney general of the United States, like that it wasn't true, uh, you know, gives more than meets the threshold, right, of, uh, you know, that he had a reasonable... Uh, uh, that he knew. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it's a deep question for maybe historians, maybe psychiatrists, the DSM-4, <laughs> but I will add my two cents as a prosecutor, 
Uh, Cassidy Hutchinson testified yeah. in Georgia yesterday, and you saw her in the January 6th committee. She said in front of her, he said, I, I'm so embarrassed we lost. She, he said, she said, Mark Meadows told me repeatedly he knows he lost. There's going to, you know, whatever sliver of sort of metaphysical doubt uh, you can try to wrestle with, I think, as a matter of legal proof in the way of you know, the best we can do about resolving anything inside um, a somebody's mind, even that um, imponderable mind, would say, yeah, he knew. So the media obviously did a pretty, play a pretty big role in propping him up the first go around and helped give him you know, upwards of a billion dollars in free press in this first election cycle. And they still, as you mentioned, the anecdote about the tweeting, will play pretty much anything he has to say on a whim because it's good for ratings. So what are the lessons up until this point, the media should have learned and should have high moving forward as he enters this new attempt of the presidency to not continually play into his hand. I, you know, look, this is a big, important subject about, you know, the question of the media and what role it played in facilitating Trump's rise and, you know, what lessons we've learned looking ahead to a new campaign. I do think it's important not to paint too broad a brush. There's a huge difference between the approach of, say, the broadcast media or the cable TV networks, uh, you know, in the 2016 primaries versus how, uh, you know, the the newspapers like the New York Times covered it versus how, uh, you know, we reacted once he did become president. Because I think those are all pose, you know, kind of different kinds of challenges. I think there were some big errors that most people would acknowledge are big errors at the very beginning, in particular with the cable television. And, you know, the idea that they were literally, you know, televising like, you know, uh, live Donald Trump's plane expected to land soon. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then he would fly around the country and they would just give him airtime to say whatever crazy stuff. They were not, you know, on the TV at that time, like real time fact checking him. You know, Okay, we've moved on from that, right? Like, I think that, you know, it's clear that's not going to happen. It was amazing to me watching Trump's announcement speech the other night. And, uh, you know, even Fox uh, gave him the hook, uh, you know, <laughs> about 40 minutes in. Uh, and there's a marked change, you know, in the willingness uh, to air him. And, of course, he was unplugged from Twitter uh, as a result of January 6th. And we'll see if Elon Musk lets him back on. Uh, and I, I have to say, it, caught, it was very interesting for me. Uh, to see the Twitter thing and what happened when Trump's account was closed. And, you know, as a journalist, of course, I'm a supporter uh, of free speech. I, I generally, you know, there were lots of debates at the time, but I generally, you know, erred on the side of, look, the man is the president of the United States. Uh, you know, we need to, it's important to understand he's, if he's going to give us this real-time insight into what he's thinking, you know, it's it's valuable intelligence and, you know, we should air it. But I have to admit, as a as a person, as a human being, when they turned him off, uh, you know, and suddenly the noise level went down and it really, it's it, it was remarkable to me. It was remarkable to me. Um, you know, that being said, that being said, I, you know, we could talk and have a whole separate podcast about this. I would say to be aware of the idea that we can sort of manage a conversation around Trump. If there's anything, in fact, that the Trump era in politics has shown me, it's that uh, we need to be more, you know, as journalists, you know, to be more humble, right, to let go of our idea that we can control and manage a conversation around uh, this guy is impossible, especially because uh, that conversation will simply go by being less visible, it, it, it's not that it's going to disappear. It's that it's just going to be targeted, you know, in a sort of right-wing ecosphere that it may be, you know, we may be missing important developments in our society. And there were a lot of people the last couple of years, they said, well, we don't, we don't need to cover Donald Trump anymore. He's done. He's over with. And some of those people are shocked now to say, wait a minute, he's coming back. He's running again. I thought, you know, he was a loser. I thought we, we dealt with this. I've had you know, Democratic friends of mine in the last couple months say, you know, I I can't believe we have to do this again. Well, if you'd been paying attention, you would have known that we were going to do this again. And that that was an inevitable moment, really, from when Trump left the White House two years ago. So I, I think this idea about deplatforming him and stuff, it's that's very risky. And as journalists, I think our job is really just is to cover aggressively and independently and critically the news. And uh, that means we're going to have to address this man as long as he holds one of our two political parties, uh, you know, hostage in some way. As you have, 
It's a great book, page by page, full of all kinds of revelations, very readable, The Divider. I wanted to thank uh, the Communications and Journalism, uh, the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and Jeff Cowan, Susan Getz, Owen Foster, Jeremiah Taylor for helping put this event together, and of course, um, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser for a great discussion about a great book. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really great. That was great, Harry. Thank you.